Welcome to the Discover Alaska Lecture Series, brought to you by UAF Summer Sessions and Lifelong Learning. My name is Althea St. Martin, and I'm your host for the series. Summer Sessions has a full lineup of free programs Monday through Thursday evenings at 7. Tomorrow night, Music in the Garden will feature the Fairbanks Community Jazz Band. That's at the Jorgensen Botanical Garden. Then on Monday, the Author's Corner will feature Rosemary McGuire with her book, Cold Latitudes. Tuesday's Healthy Living series is the topic will be breast cancer reconstruction with Dr. Eric Martell, who is a plastic surgeon with the Tanana Valley Clinic. And next Wednesday, you're on your own, as this is the last of the 2021 Discover Alaska series. But there's good news. Discover Alaska will be back again next year. So send your suggestions for programs that you would like to hear about next summer and send those to the Summer Sessions office. This is the 16th session series for the Discover Alaska and the in-person programs are held here in the beautiful BP Design Theater. It is also live streamed and recorded, which allows a much larger audience to view the presentation. Later, you can review and share this lecture in all of the Summer Sessions lectures from past years too, by going to Summer Sessions website at uaf.edu backslash summer backslash events. And tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce the speaker, Mike Pollan. Mike is an alumnus of UAF and works as a water wastewater systems consultant and operations trainer. He has over 50 years of experience providing water and wastewater laboratory and consulting services in Alaska and throughout the world. He is a past president of the Water Environment Federation and serves on the governor's water and wastewater advisory board. Mike will share how Alaska has a unique set of challenges in bringing water to its communities. His presentation will provide an overview of the climate and water related issues that water systems managers and operators must overcome. A brief history of Alaska's water treatment practices will be presented up to the current area era where some of the most advanced water treatment technology ever developed is operating successfully right here. And I'll warn you, there's probably going to be some puns in his presentation. Here's Mike Pollan to present water treatment in Alaska from ice age to the space age. Mike, welcome. Thank you, Althea. Well, greetings, everybody. It is my honor to be here and to provide an interesting overview of this topic. This is really a lot of material to try and cover in a, a one hour lecture, but I'm going to go ahead and, and talk about a few topics here. And just to get things started, what I want to do is I want to present a quick outline of what we're going to talk about tonight. To begin with, what I want to do is just provide a very brief history of water practices. Um, sources of water that people have used throughout uh, the history. I want to talk a little bit about the types of water sources, both surface water and groundwater, and talk about some of the conventional treatment practices that people have used and developed um, over the last hundred years or so in this state. And then what I want to do is I want to jump forward into an era with some of the most advanced water treatment technology available anywhere in the world. This is technology that's being used both on this planet uh, and currently in the space station and is being proposed for uh, water systems that will be used both on the moon and on the surface of Mars in the future. Um, I'm going to give you four examples of the applications of that technology as we go through this presentation. So to begin with, for millennia, the indigenous people of Alaska, they moved around. They had a lot of distance between them, which is a great way to keep disease from spreading. We've talked about social distancing, or as I like to call it, anti-social distancing. But the bottom line is, is these people were moving around and they used whatever clean water they could find and there was not a big problem with disease transmission. The situation was basically um, very conducive to Alaska because of our vast geography. One of the sources of water 
which is actually still used today and is very interesting. And I learned this from some Inupiat whale hunters up in Barrow, uh, Utiagvik they call it now, that if you harvest the bluest of the ice on the sea ice, it has the lowest salt content and it tastes the best. And they continue to do that today when they're out on their whale hunts. The age of discovery. Population of foreigners, populations of foreigners began to come to this state. And whenever they set up settlements, they needed to have clean water sources. Uh, this is New Archangel, which we now know as Sitka. And in this particular uh, community that was built, there's a beautiful river called Indian River, not far out of town. And that particular river was one of the prime water sources for this community. It served the community well. In an interesting sort of turn of events, uh, in a more recent era, the Blue Lake Dam, which is the dam that's used for the water system in the city of Sitka, had to be raised to increase the power output and to be able to store more water. During that time, the water supply from Blue Lake had to be shut down. They went back to Indian River and they set up an advanced membrane treatment process, which will be uh, the topic of the discussion later on in this speech. And they treated the water for the community out of the ancient Indian River uh, through a membrane system. That system now has been uh, returned to the, to the supplier. It was a lease system, and they're back to Blue Lake. The gold rush up here, communities began developing very quickly, and we needed water sources. We had to have locations where the community, community could easily access water for potable purposes, but we also placed an enormous demand on water supplies for the placer mining operations. Uh, earlier this, um, this summer, we had a speech on the Davidson Ditch. That was a major method of bringing water into the mining areas exactly for that purpose. How did they do this when they got it into the community? This is some old piping. This is how we used to move water. We have evidence in the historical record dating back to four to 6,000 BC of the use of bamboo piping to move water in places in the Western Pacific and in South Asia. Here, we hollowed out logs. And an interesting variation on that is the wood stave piece of pipe you see in the lower right. That particular type of pipe is still in use today. As a matter of fact, in downtown Fairbanks, where they were excavating some of the uh, roads out, they found wood stave piping. And some of that piping was found to be still in excellent condition after being in the ground for over a century. They relined it with a high-tech polyethylene liner and they're gonna use it for another 100 years. Why not? It works. So interesting uh, how we did that. Today, most of the piping that we have on larger systems is made of two kinds. We have ductile cast iron. Here, what we do is we blow a high-density polyurethane foam. We add a little heat to the water and we circulate it. That's how we keep things from freezing here. Now, if you go out into the villages, and the villages begin growing once we had permanent settlements, as uh, the native populations were gathered into these locations, they too had to find proper water supplies. And that has been a real problem because many of these villages are in areas where the water supply is, if it's a surface supply, is frozen solid uh, for much of the year, or if it's groundwater, it's virtually inaccessible. I'm gonna talk about that in a little while. But becoming, um, it became very critical for these populations to be able to find good water, and that became the topic of more design work. So here's an example, and this is in the Bethel area, uh, of what we use for the same uh, type of circulating water systems, but here it's put inside of a type of pipe we call Arctic pipe. And this is a metal jacketed, high density polyethylene insulated HDPE, which is, which is a heat fusion, fusion welded type of pipe. The integrity of that pipe is so good, we use this for natural gas distribution. As well you can imagine, this is also gonna be just fine for water, and they actually use it for vacuum sewer systems which is an interesting adaptation. Most of the villages have a watering point where people can go and, and pick up their water. They have, uh, where they have roads and trucks available, they actually have water delivery services. We have that here in Fairbanks. So this is a, um, a common practice we do in Alaska. So let's talk about water sources very briefly. Okay, first of all, surface water sources. Most of the population centers, the big population centers in the world, use surface water supplies. That's where we settled. That's where the populations went to. There was arable land, there was water available. They could irrigate. They had water that was moving. They could turn a wheel to grind grain and later to make power. We also now know and learned way back then that you could move bulk quantities of goods on water better, easier, and cheaper than any other way of moving any kind of, of produce, any kind of minerals, any kind of products. And so this is where the big cities grew. The problem is, is that those surface water supplies were very restricted 
um, in quality after we got too many cities and too many towns built up along the same waterways. So the bottom line is that type of water is easy to determine how much you have and the quality of it. You can walk right out and take a sample, but it can be contaminated very easily. It tends, tends to change um, very rapidly in quality and quantity with the change in the seasons. If we have nutrient runoffs, we experience things like algae blooms, which can create color, taste, uh, plugging of filters, plugging of intake screens, and unfortunately in some cases some fairly dangerous levels of toxicity. Surface water also must be treated in this country by a set of rules, and there's actually five sets of rules the EPA has that are embodied under the surface water treatment rules. Basically, the water has to be filtered and disinfected. Some examples of surface water systems in Alaska. Um, starting on the left, uh, this is a picture of the clarifier gallery in the 40 million gallon per day occluding water treatment plant, which is the largest water treatment plant uh, surface water system currently in the state of Alaska. The one in the middle is a direct filtration plant. This is way up in the village of Buckland. This particular plant is typical of probably 200 or so such systems throughout the rural Alaska. These particular plants have various types of media inside pressure vessels. Uh, some are used for various purposes for taking out iron, for example, or they may, taking out, may be used for taking out color. Uh, but this is a very popular type of system. Uh, the one on the right is a slow sand filtration plant. This is a very old technology and uh, was adopted in the mid-1800s as the first municipal sand uh, filtration type systems that were widely used. When those were adopted, the infectivity rates or the infection rates from things like cholera and typhoid fell from 100 per 100,000 per population uh, to less than 10 per 100,000. And in the early 1900s, when chlorination was adopted, those numbers fell to less than one per 100,000. So two logs of, of basically uh, health improvement is produced by filtration and disinfection. And that is embodied in the, um, in the science today. Now groundwater sources. One of the big advantages of groundwater is the, the groundwater system is being passed through aquifers. It's being filtered. So it's very low in microbiological content. Under the current rules, in um, EPA in the state of Alaska, you don't necessarily have to disinfect groundwater, but you have to meet the microbiological standards. And we have a number of cities in this state that do that without disinfection. The quality and the temperature of the water and the output of the aquifers remains fairly consistent. And that's a very important factor in, in being able to set up a water treatment plant and maintain a constant flow. Disadvantages. We have more minerals, we have iron, we have manganese, we have high calcium magnesium content, what we call hardness. We have arsenic, nitrates, uh, a variety of inorganic substances. We also have persistent chemicals that may be deposited in the aquifers through spills, underground fuel spills, for example. Um, we've had some interesting uh, synthetic organic chemical issues here in Fairbanks. Besides fuel spills, a major sulfalane spill that came from one of the old refineries now decommissioned out in North Pole has contaminated a large groundwater area. We have um, the current um, sort of the contaminant of the year is, is per and polyfluorinated alkyl substances, these forever chemicals, of which there are thousands that um, are being regulated at levels uh, or will probably be regulated at levels. Currently we have health advisory limits down in the parts per trillion levels. And uh, these are compounds that are carried by groundwater plumes. Pumping costs may be higher because the wells are deeper. So an example of some groundwater systems that we have in Alaska. Um, on the left we have um, a very common type of system. In fact, this is probably the most common type of treatment system in many of the villages and, and communities in Alaska. It's called a manganese green sand filter. It has a special kind of media that is very capable of taking out iron and manganese and arsenic. This type of filter also does a great job removing sulfides, the rotten egg odor that we get out of some wells. Um, these are in uh, systems um, throughout the state of Alaska. There are upwards of about 100 of these just in the yukon Kuskokwim Delta alone. Uh, the middle one is a softener, ion exchange softener. Many of you may actually have one of these in your home on a smaller scale. This takes out hardness, but it also will take out iron and manganese. And it is designed to be regenerated with ordinary salt, a high purity type of, a, of salt pellets. The one on the far right was an iron and manganese removal plant here at UAF. And the groundwater contained iron, manganese. It had some other chemical problems, uh, including some old fuel spill issues. Um, and it had a very strong sulfide presence. And so they built a big aeration plant on the front end of it. And it basically converted all of the iron and manganese to something that would precipitate, it would settle. 
And so the clarifiers that you see in the picture on the right, uh, there were two package treatment plant trains that were designed to settle the iron and the manganese out. Um, there were some additional chemicals added, but this is what served this campus um, for many, many years, from literally the 1980s until about five, six years ago when the system was finally tied into the College Utilities Corporation. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to shift gears and I want to talk about where water treatment technology is going. <clears throat> and I alluded to the, to the concept of, of membrane treatment. And membranes are what we have begun developing um, in wider applications throughout the state, uh, throughout the world. But I want to tell you some stories specifically about Alaska. First of all, membrane systems were developed um, it's American technology. We developed this. This was in the 1960s. UCAL Berkeley was one of the first places. What they were trying to do is they were trying to separate out chemical solutions, concentrate the chemicals by pressurizing a solution and shoving it through, in this case, a cellulose acetate membrane, a kind of a wood, wood pulp type membrane. It worked. It separated the chemicals. And then somebody took a look at the water that came through and they said, oh my goodness, it's like distilled water. They had desalinated. And from there, the technology was picked up very rapidly by who else? The US military. And they began putting shipboard systems um, on board, first of all, nuclear submarines, but other ships. Uh, and today, reverse osmosis desalination systems based on these early uh, research efforts are present on virtually every major ship in the world. <clears throat> but more on this as we pass through here. Potable water treatment applications were developed uh, but those were basically secondary to industrial applications. Industries that needed extremely high pure quality water, very low salt and very low uh, mineral content water <clears throat> adopted these, like the pharmaceutical industry, food processing industry, high pressure boil industry, and of late, the computer industry. The computer chips in the final stage have to be washed in all extremely high purity water. If a single metallic contaminant gets into one of these processors, it can absolutely destroy it. <clears throat> so they need extremely high purity water. Now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play a short video clip that talks about membranes. And um, this is from the American Water Works Association, which is the largest organization in the world in this field, and is kind of like the American Medical Association of, of Water Technologies. So here we go. A majority of utilities that use membranes are using the type that are pressure-driven. Pressure-driven membranes include microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, and reverse osmosis. Microfiltration, or MF, and ultrafiltration, UF, are sieving processes, which means they have pores that act like strainers. As water is forced through the membrane, under pressure, contaminants too large to fit through the pores are held back or rejected. MF and UF are pressure-driven membranes that operate between about 10 to 50 PSI. MF and UF are a form of filtration similar to granular filtration in that they are used for particle removal. They turn typical surface water into potable water in the same way traditional treatment does through coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation, and filtration. Microfiltration membranes typically have a nominal pore size of about 0.1 microns. Those pores remove suspended matter, bacteria, turbidity, algae, fungi, and protozoa such as Giardia and Cryptosporidium. Microfiltration membranes are not effective for the removal of viruses or disinfection byproduct precursors. They are also not able to remove natural organic matter without the use of coagulation upstream. Ultrafiltration membranes typically have a nominal pore size of 0.01 microns, 10 times smaller than microfiltration pores. In addition to the same capabilities as MF, UF membranes can also remove viruses. MF and UF have been shown to be incredibly effective for removing particles in water, typically producing water with turbidity levels below 0.05 NTU. However, they do not remove inorganic chemicals such as chlorides or nitrates, nor do they remove metals or other ionic materials. To meet that challenge, some utilities are using semi-permeable desalination membranes, nanofiltration, and reverse osmosis processes. These membranes don't have pores. Instead, the water diffuses across the molecular structure of the membranes. Most molecules of suspended or dissolved substances can't pass through the membrane. These processes are more powerful 
but more expensive to operate. They require more pretreatment and higher operating pressures. Nanofiltration, or NF, operates between 75 and 250 PSI, and reverse osmosis, or RO, can require operating pressures as high as 1200 PSI. Nanofiltration was originally developed as an alternative water softening treatment process. Like traditional lime softening, NF reduces the level of calcium and magnesium in hard waters. It is also more effective than lime at removing color. Nanofiltration will reject or remove most natural organic matter, DBP precursors, and microorganisms. NF has even been used to remove organic compounds such as pesticides. The other type of diffusion-controlled membrane process is reverse osmosis, or RO. RO was first used on municipal water supplies in the 1960s as a method of removing salts from brackish water. In recent years, RO systems have become more efficient and less expensive. And as water quality regulations tighten, reverse osmosis is becoming more popular for water treatment. RO can remove more contaminants than any of the other membrane processes. It is so effective, the US EPA endorses it as the best available method for removing inorganic chemicals from water. RO is used in agricultural areas to treat ground and surface waters contaminated with nitrates. RO is also one of the only technologies to economically remove salts from water. As a result, an increasing number of utilities are using RO to tap previously unusable water sources. Some facilities are even using reverse osmosis for reuse applications. Reuse applications. That's wastewater. And we have utilities in this country that are taking wastewater effluent, treating it through one type of membrane, putting it back in a shallow aquifer and recovering it and putting it through another membrane that goes right back in the water system. It's like a do loop on a computer system. So we recycle. So I want to just take a moment and, and sort of refresh what this little video talked about with the types of membranes. And if you look at this, um, this little slide, if we, this is in a logarithmic scale here, but microfiltration, as I said, is separating at a, de at a um, separation of about 0, .0 or about 0 0.1 microns. And microfiltration um, is able to remove out um, most of the larger microorganisms and particles in the turbidity in water. At that point, you actually are meeting the criteria of the surface water treatment rule. So in one step, this meets all the filtration criteria of, of the complex surface water treatment rules. Ultrafiltration, as it mentioned, is down to a 0.01 micron. It will remove viruses. Ultrafiltration is a disinfection technology. And EPA has yet to classify it as that formally, but hang on, it's coming. The other two technologies are what they called uh, molecular separation, molecular diffusion. Water molecules are extremely tiny, and they will pass through these types of membranes and the larger ionized particles that are the calcium, the magnesium, and even the salt like sodium and chloride, they will not pass through. <clears throat> but we have to push the water very hard because we have very high concentrations of those salts to push the fresh water out of the salt water. So that's a quick primer on it. And just to give you an idea of the size, if we take a look at the sizes here, the size of the width of a human hair would be about 25 to 50 microns across. So we are way, way below the level that anything visual is taking place. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to talk about four examples of membrane development in Alaska. So the first place I want to talk about is Barrow. And Barrow Utilities and Electric Co-op is a, a utility that's been in service up there since the, the 1960s. And they were one of the first developers of desalination technology um, for use in Alaska. <clears throat> this particular uh, facility you see here, this is the upper dam for what's called the Asatkoak Reservoir. This is actually a three dam, uh, or two dam, three stage overflow system that backed up an ancient water supply. This particular water supply um, was actually a lake that broke through and connected to the ocean, so it became saline. And when they built the first dam in the 1960s, this was done by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, the lake level rose and some of the salt flushed out and the salinity went down. Then they built a second dam, about 1976, the Public Health Service built it. Backed up the third reservoir, and now the salinity was even less than that as fresh water would flush it out. Interestingly enough, <clears throat> one of the things that they determined that they might try to do uh, and this was a, the uh, design of the Public Health Service. Um, 
uh, a colleague of mine by the name of Art Ronimus was the one who came up with the idea. They took a very high powered diesel pump, a fire pump, and pulled it out on the top of the reservoir and they drilled a hole in the ice at the end of winter. The end of winter up there is like the beginning of June. And they drilled a hole in it and they pumped the, the thickest of the brine out from under the ice. There was eight to 10 feet of ice and the remaining 10 feet or so of water was actually kind of a bowl in the bottom and it was so saline that they got most of the salt out. And then it refilled with fresh water. They did that two years in a row and when it was done, uh, the salinity was low in the summer but it rose to it's still about 5,000 milligrams per liter. To compare, the oceans have about 35,000. So this is about a one-seventh of ocean salinity in the dead of winter. So they still had to desalinate. What Barrow Utilities was using is they were using an old shipboard desalination plant, basically an evaporator. Uh, it's called a vapor compression unit. We'll get into the details, but uh, it ran uh, and produced essentially distilled water. This is a picture, the background picture here is actually an identical unit to the one Barrow Utilities ran. They had two of these out at the Naval Arctic Research Laboratory. That's how they treated their water. So there were three of these operating in Barrow back then. This graph is actually out of a publication, um, a paper I presented once for American Water Works. And what this is showing is the salinity levels and on the um, y-axis on the left, uh, the top number up here is 5,000. So this is the salinity levels. And as you can see, it rises up until it hits the, the dead of winter and then a spring break up and it falls. And then it rises and falls, rises and falls. That's the pattern as the um, uh, reservoir goes through its uh, cycles. And <clears throat> the first two of these were back in 1976 and 1977 when the Public Health Service actually pumped the brine out from underneath. And when they were done, the winter levels <clears throat> were down to just, it was actually less than 1,500. So the utility still had to desalinate. So what Barrow Utilities decided to do is to, besides distillation, they reached out to a couple of companies that were developing this new RO technology. The DuPont Corporation had just developed a brand new system using a hollow fiber membrane. This membrane has about a 40 inch um, long, eight inch diameter tube. It has about 50,000 of these tiny membranes that go in and fold and in and fold, and they're locked into epoxy blocks, and you shove the water in and pressurize it to about 400 PSI, and the fresh water squeezes out of the salt water, and it worked. The first prototype test of the DuPont Corporation in the entire world was in Barrow, Alaska with this unit. They tested this thing in 1976. I was there. And there was a young Inupiat girl who took a glass of water out of the end of this unit, took a sip of it, and a big smile. That picture went on the DuPont Corporation's global marketing. And for about the next 15 years, they owned the desalination business. They sold thousands of these in the Middle East, all over the world, where salt removal was, was important. So the bottom line is this technology was tested there and very quickly, Barrow Utilities said, uh, we want this, this is what we want to do. So I worked with them, uh, helped them design this unit. And in 1981, we started up 150,000 gallon per day version of this and it operated until 1999. So this is two 75,000 gallon per day versions of the uh, unit, the 25,000 gallon per day unit we just saw. It needed a whole conventional treatment plant though to prepare the water to be able to go through those membranes. So it had a, um, a coagulation, flocculation, sedimentation basin, sand filters, and that's what all the blue equipment is up here on the right. And that prepared the water to go through the membranes. And so for about 18 years, this is how Barrow treated its water, and very successfully so. But again, keep in mind, this was one of the first major global applications of this technology. Now, I want to shift gears. I'm going to come back to Barrow in a little bit, but I want to talk a little bit now about the, the YK Delta. Yukon Kuskokwim Delta is um, a, uh, an area with, with many villages. There's like 60 villages out there. And they are sitting on top of 300 to 350 feet of solid permafrost. Beneath that permafrost layer is an artesian aquifer with water that has enough water quality issues to open up a retail store. They have high iron, they have high manganese, they have high hardness. There's arsenic in it, it's got sulfide. It has organic matter that is just so thick that they bring it up and if it makes it through the plant, that organic matter reacts with the chlorine and they form a host of, of other chemicals called disinfection byproducts. They talked about that in the video. They have issues that were completely startling to me when I first found it. There's ammonia coming out of the ground. Where in the heck is the ammonia coming from? What's all this organic matter? 
Well, I finally figured out what it was. Years ago, my, uh, my wife and I, uh, we built our first house here in Fairbanks. We had a well drilled. Uh, and the well driller, a uh, gentleman by the name of Bud Swan, I don't know if anybody remembers that name, but a great, great guy. And he would drill a well, and when he drilled through a well that had lots of iron, lots of sulfide, he'd say, oh, drilled through a woolly mammoth. Okay, so the bottom line is, I think that's what they're doing out there. They're drilling through, they are finding the, the dead dinosaurs, the woolly mammoths, from the last ice age. What is permafrost? It's the last ice age still frozen in the ground. That's what it is. So they're drilling through, and they get this organic matter coming up. Well, what's the ammonia? Well, what is this organic matter in the, in the dead mammoths? What's, what's it made of? Proteins. Proteins are made of amino acids. And under acidic conditions, and this water is also acidic, it releases ammonium ion, and ammonium ion forms ammonia. And the bottom line is, is that's what's reacting in the plant. So they have all these water quality issues. The bottom line is, this was a very difficult type of water to treat. So, here is an example of a membrane application. So this organization, the Lower Cusquim School District, did an incredibly innovative idea, and they took what is um, a remarkably um, resilient membrane system using tubes. And each one of these tubular bundles, these are six feet long. There's two versions of these, six feet and 12 feet long. Each one of these six foot long bundles has 72 3 8 inch diameter looks like cardboard tubes inside of this thing, and the inside is coated with either an ultrafiltration membrane or a nanofiltration membrane. If it's just particle removal, they use the UF, and if it's removal of organics, they use the NF membrane. The bottom line is, is they built a, an elaborate pretreatment system that utilizes uh, aeration and other chemical oxidants to react with the iron and the manganese and the arsenic and get rid of the sulfides before they put it in the membranes. And in another innovative piece of this, they're operating these in about 10 schools out in the area. And these are a little more complicated, requires a little higher level certified operator. So they have a special, what's called alternative method of system supervision from the state of Alaska. And the higher level certified operator is working from a SCADA system screen. We call it a human machine interface now, I love that. And he's operating this thing in Bethel. And the eyes, ears, legs, and hands on the ground in the villages are operators in training, the operators that have just the simplest of certifications, but they work for these, they have rotating level two operators in Bethel that do this, and this system is working and has been working now for almost 12 years, and very successfully. So here's a picture of the aeration tank, uh, where they're oxidizing the iron and manganese, and uh, there's a clarifier, once you've, again, you've turned it into a particle, it'll settle out, and then they feed it into the membranes. And this is how the membranes are clean. It's just really neat. This, this technology, by the way, was developed in uh, Scotland, as I love to say. I'm about a quarter Scottish myself. Uh, the bottom line is, is they developed a system where they have these little blue foam balls. And when this unit would start up, the little foam plug in here literally goes zip back and forth, back and forth through all 72 membranes and pops out in another one of these catches in front of a screen with a little, little plastic view. Uh, viewing port on the other side. So it cleans it. And about every four hours, the flow reverses and it back and forth and it pops out and the thing flushes. That goes down the drain and the system is cleaned. The operator can set the time on the cleaning, but every time it started or stopped, it goes through an automatic cleaning cycle. And this system is working. This system works so well that if you go up to Point Thompson, where ExxonMobil has one of the most recently developed oil uh, field camp systems up there for the giant gas field and gas liquids field, um, they are using this technology in the 12 foot version in their camp. So this has been adopted now by the oil industries. I want to talk to you about membrane softening. Okay, down in the Healy Canyon, I encountered some of the highest concentrations of calcium magnesium that I've ever seen in my life. And this particular organization, this is the Holland America Princess, the Denali Princess Wilderness Lodge. This is the largest hotel in the state of Alaska. I think it's 700 rooms is what they have. <clears throat> Unfortunately, it was not operated last year, but it's open this year. So good luck with that. Hope they, hope they have a great season. But here's just some details on the hardness. If you look at the ranking of hardness, which is an unregulated parameter, in other words, there's no DEC or EPA rules that says this is the hardness you have to have. They don't do that. They think, on most of the scales, that something above 300 milligrams per liter of hardness is very hard water. 
I measured 1,800 out of the original wells. This is basically a low-grade concrete slurry coming out of the ground that's doubling as drinking water. Drinking water. And besides that, it had up to 700 milligrams per liter of sulfate. Now, sulfate is an interesting chemical. Sulfate has a standard, it's called a secondary standard because it doesn't have an immediate health effect as much as it's just an inconvenience. The standard is 250 milligrams per liter. Above that, the effect is, um, it basically, um, it, it causes you to have to go to the bathroom too often. So, what we have is we have something that is going to be put in glasses and serve to how many tens of thousands of Geritol jet setters do we have rolling into the Denali area every year, come in, stay at the hotel, have a lovely dinner, looking out over the Manana River, slug down a bunch of sulfate rich, rich water, what do we do with them? Six o'clock the next morning, we put them on a school bus and we bounce them 80 miles over a gravel road out to the Isles and Visitor Center. There's a reason that they have rows of outhouses about every 10 miles. So, what do you do with this? Well, we went down and we pilot tested a membrane. This was a brand new membrane that had been developed by a company um, uh, called Film Tech that was actually, uh, or Fluid Systems, I should say. Um, they were acquired by Film Tech later. The Fluid Systems company was actually a company developed by some of the original researchers from UCAL Berkeley. And I actually worked with them. They were designing a brand new type of membrane. And they said, we'd love to test this out. I had a little pilot test unit that I'd gotten from a manufacturer in Florida. And I said, OK, this is what we have for hardness. And they went, whoa, never seen anything like that before. And nevertheless, they made some special membranes for them. I still actually have one of these. I think it's going to be a museum piece someday. But they sent it up, and we pilot tested it, and we took all the hardness out. We took all the sulfate out. We made water that was so clear that when the staff of the hotel came to actually, it was a beautiful day, we're outdoors, it was day like today, tables all set up and I've got the water that's coming out of this unit, we tried a softener, we tried an ion exchange unit, we tried a bunch of other stuff and none of that worked very well, but we played a little shell game and tested the water. So they had the engineer, they had the chief, uh, the general manager of the hotel, they had the chef and they had the head of the bar, the bartender. And they brought these four people out and they tested all the water and everybody picked the membrane, it was a blind test. So the bartender said, we're not done yet. He whips out an 18-year-old bottle of Macallan scotch, and he starts pouring shots into the water. He says, if it turns black, we don't want it. The only one that didn't turn black was the RO. Now, we're good scientists. So you don't just do one test. We have to do a statistically significant replicate. So we did three. God bless them. They gave me a room for the night. But the test was enormously successful. And this is what they have today. They have a 0.2 million gallon per day membrane softening plant operating in this hotel, and there are dozens more like it around the state of Alaska. We have in place right now over a million gallons per day of this technology that we pilot tested down there in 1994. Uh, the membranes have to be clean with citric acid, get a little bit of a deposit in it, and the um, membrane is stored over water in a, it's a disinfecting solution, it's called a reducing agent. Uh, chlorine would kill the membranes, but they use something that's as strong as chlorine, but it's got the opposite uh, chemical effect and the membrane isn't damaged. It's called sodium metabisulfite. But they pickle the membranes over the winter. It's in warm storage. Next summer, they flush it out, fire it up, bang, they take the hardness out. But the new wells that they drilled uh, had about a fifth as much hardness, so it was, it was much better after the first plant was lost to a fire. Now, the last story I want to share with you is probably the one that um, I think is the most powerful. And this is back to the Asatkawak Reservoir. This is Barrow. And one of the things that happened is over the years from 1981 to 1999, by the time they got in the middle 1990s, the salinity had been taken down to such a low level that they no longer needed to desalinate. And what they were discovering is that the membranes were struggling to operate because they were so susceptible to fouling. The reservoir was changing. So what we needed to do was come up with an alternative method of treatment. So, um, in 1994, my company, Northern Testing Laboratories, Inc., at the time, we conducted a pilot test and we tested four different treatment technologies, including a nanofiltration membrane. Now, by the way, this was the same kind of membrane that worked down um, later that same summer in, uh, in the Denali area. And the result was the development of one of the first, what's called an integrated membrane system uh, in the entire world. Now, by integrated membranes, here was the concept. They needed nanofilters to take out organic matter. We had a lot of organic matter. In fact, 
Um, EPA considers four milligrams per liter of total organic carbon, it's a way of measuring organic matter, to be a problem in raw water. I measured in the mid-20s in this reservoir, higher in the winter, lower in the summer. Everything was way above four. So they had a problem with the organic matter, which again can react with the chlorine and it makes disinfection byproducts. So that was the goal, was to get rid of the organic matter. The nanofilters work beautifully, but to protect the nanofilters, I was working with an engineering group that was um, helping with the design on this, and we got together and they said, you know what, what if we take a microfilter and use that to protect the nanofilter and do two stages of filtration, one that takes out particles, one that takes out organics? Why not? So here it is. We tested it. We ended up with two 40 gallon per minute versions of this and these units were set up and installed. It was about four years later that these were actually designed and built and installed and began operating and they worked very well. Um, the unit that you see here in the background, uh, there's some vertical tubes, those are the microfilters. And so the microfilters were making water that the nanofilters could treat. The nanofilters were solving the problem with the organic matter. And this system worked extremely well. It was successfully pilot tested, but we, inter we found an interesting problem. There was some bacteria that were getting through, even the microfilters just probably through around some of the, the gaskets and just the other, you know, the 25 cent pieces. It wasn't going through the membranes. But all you need to do is get a few bacteria to colonize in there and they would make biofilms. The biofilms were causing the nanofilters to plug very quickly. And we knew it was bacteria because the plugging rate was exponential because bacteria double their rate like every five minutes, uh, one cell into two, into four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, you know where this is going. And what we came up with is, well, you can't disinfect those membranes because the chlorine would kill it. But if you use a type of chlorine that you react with ammonia, back to Bethel, then you get what's called chloramines. It's a weaker form of chlorine. It is a bactericide, but it won't kill the membrane. We did that and it worked. And this was the first use of chloramination in a membrane pretreatment technology in the entire world. This was a system that was built. It's a 0.35 million gallon per day integrated membrane system. And this, uh, the vertical uh, membranes you see on the right, that is about a 1 million gallon per day uh, surface water treatment plant. That thing is about, it's about 10 feet across at the bottom, about six feet deep and about 14 feet high and you're making a million gallons per day of, of surface water uh, that meets the EPA standards. Nanofiltration array on the side um, is called what's a 3-2-1 array. It has six membranes on the bottom that takes the water, the next four take the reject from that, treat that, and then the reject from that goes through the next two. They get 92% recovery. For every 1,000 gallons of water that goes into these membranes, 920 comes out as treated water. That's an incredibly high efficiency. So the raw water basically, um, it was heated. They had some strainers on there. The, the operators jokingly call them fish screens. They catch these little nine spine sticklebacks in them. Um, the final effluent uh, was disinfected with chlorine. The pH was adjusted, fluoride is added. It's one of the places that still fluoridates. And a corrosion inhibitor control, corrosion in the water distribution system is added. And it's interesting that uh, this works so well and continues to work well um, that the um, the system has now been expanded. I'm going to show you the expanded system here in a moment. But the effect of this, and what I want to share with you now, is that in this distribution system, they have the world's first completely buried underground four miles of walk-through utilidor system buried in solid permafrost. It's the only thing like it in the world. Notice HDPE pipe. This is one of the first large-scale applications of that pipe in the state of Alaska and a uh, variable frequency drive, extremely high efficiency pump system. So this is where the trihalomethanes, haloacetic acid, these disinfection byproducts, the organic chlorine chemicals would form is in the distribution system. And it all comes back to this central tank. This is a stainless steel 30,000 gallon central tank called the mixed tank. Uh, that's the pump skid we were looking at right here in the foreground. And so the entire system is circulated through multiple loops throughout barrel, comes back into this building, and they sample it for disinfection byproducts. I want to show you the data. And thank you to Barrel Utilities, by the way, for letting me use this data and, and share this with you tonight. The, the top of the peak here, first of all, the scale on the left side, this is the concentration of these two classes of disinfection byproducts. 
And the blue line is called haloacetic acids. The very top line, 80 parts per billion micrograms per liter, that's the standard. The second one, the red line, is what's called haloacetic acids. There's five of those compounds. And the combined total of those is a standard of 60. So uh, what you see is the, the peak that's, that's occurring here and then drops off suddenly, that's when the new membranes were installed. Now this data goes forward. There was a change in the membranes here and then it continues forward. This is almost at the non-detect level for haloacetic acids, the red line. And the blue line is, is down into single digits um, in parts per billion. This system is completely in compliance. And remember again, they are dealing with a soup of an influent calling it influent, that's what we call sewage, but that lagoon is soupy in the summer. It's so full of organic matter and worse in the winter under the ice. And we're treating it to a level that we are able to literally, they put 0.7 milligrams per liter of chlorine in that water. It goes into storage tanks, is circulated around the town, and in 10 days later, you have still 0.65 milligrams per liter of chlorine that's so stable. There's nothing in the water for it to react with. This is barrel. Uh, the upgrade of the system, now they have an algae problem in the lagoon. There was some fertilizers that were put in for some building projects and algae blooms are occurring. So they put in a new pre-filter. They doubled the size of the system. They went from microfiltration to ultrafiltration on the pre-filters. These are the brand new units, same company, Memcor, which by the way is from Australia. And um, that is pre-treating the water for uh, now they have two of the 350,000 gallon per day nanofiltration racks. So this basically is a technology that was developed. This has been adopted into six more North Slope borough villages and the oil and gas industry across the North Slope of Alaska. This is where it started. And what I'd like to share with you is just a, a quick excerpt. This book is one of the manuals of practice from the American Water Works Association. Those are the people with the video I showed you earlier. <clears throat> this is called microfiltration and ultrafiltration membranes for drinking water. So this is how you do your work. And page 123 is a case study, Barrow Utilities and Electric Cooperative Incorporated microfiltration, nanofiltration, dual membrane plant. And what I want to read to you is the summary. The BUECI dual membrane demonstration plant was the first drinking water production facility in North America to use the dual membrane process of MF and NF. The success of this plant as described resulted in BUECI installing a larger 240 gallon per minute, that was the 350,000 gallon per day plant, in 1998. The new plant together with the demonstration plant now provides a source of high quality drinking water to the residents of Barrow, Alaska. This is the how-to book to do membranes by the organization that does more of this than anybody in the world. One last pitch. One of the things I do is I train operators. And I've had the, the good fortune of training many of the operators in, in many of the facilities we saw tonight. And there's a big demand for operators. So if you know some young people, if you know some middle-aged people, or even some old people that are interested in an interesting career, this is one that has a combination of chemistry, biology, mechanics, hydraulics. Uh, you've got to be, you got to know something about PR. You've got to know something, you're dealing with your city council and, and the water systems. But there's a huge demand for high level certified operators. It's a great field, it's wide open, um, and the opportunity is knocking. So absolutely guaranteed water is your near future. So thank you very much for your interest in water technology. Um, I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak to the Discover Alaska lecture. Uh, is one of the final lectures, or the final lecture of the year. And um, <clears throat> the thing I would like to leave uh, as a dangling thought here is Alaska plays second fiddle to nobody in the world when it comes to water technology. We were the first. We are some of the best. Thank you. Great presentation. I'm going to question every glass of water that I drink now. <laughs> Did anyone have questions here? Ultimately, it, it comes down to uh, how much does it cost to produce a thousand or ten thousand gallons of water, or a million gallons, depending on the size of the community and what the purposes are. Uh, for a um, town of two hundred and fifty, for example, what kind of water uh, could be produced at what kind of reasonable price? That is a great question. I appreciate you actually asking that. Um, and one of the whole pieces I left out of this 
is what's happening with this technology in, in the cost universe. The big picture. The cost of membranes is doing this. The cost of conventional treatment is doing this. About five years ago, those lines crossed. If you started today with a clean sheet design, and you were building a brand new water plant in the village of 250, and you started with barren ground, and you had to build a building, membranes are small. They're very compact, so your building just got small and very compact. So the cost per square foot of construction is, is a big number. We're, we, we're in high hundreds, thousand dollars a square foot for industrial buildings now. And if you're in a village, it's, it's in excess of that. Membrane technology, because the cost has come down, the actual hardware costs less than the conventional treatment in many cases. Let me give you a specific example. The 350,000 gallon per day membrane plant, there are 40 uh, inch diameter, eight inch pressure vessels that are pushed inside of those, those tubes. Each one of those tubes, there's 12 tubes, each one has eight. So there are 96 pressure, um, actual nanofiltration elements inside those membranes. When BUECI bought the first batch of those and installed them in, and started that plant in 1998, they paid $125,000 for those membranes. Now the, the unit was, had a capital cost of course. They went back, the membrane manufacturer told them, you'll be lucky to get six years out of them. With this chloramine pretreatment system that we put together for them, they got 10. So they got four more years out of service than they thought they were going to get. And when they went back, they bought exactly the same membrane, same manufacturer, same model number. And in 2009, they paid $54,000 for 96 of them. And I'm not inflation adjusting the dollars. That's $54,000, $2,009 versus $125,000 of $1999 or $1998. So the, the membrane, the global production is, has gone up so much, the cost of elements has gone down, the performance is getting better, the durability is getting better. But that is a, a, a bona fide question as to the cost. None of this is free. <laughs> sure. Given that, it would seem that this, this next year, you know, 2022, 2023, 2025 is the period here, where we have enormous amounts of money are being uh, dispersed uh, through the, the political system uh, or infrastructure. And this seems like a very basic infrastructure for uh, a state that is enormous and yet tiny in population. And, mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so the amount of money that potentially could come here would require a lot of cooperation among various parties who don't always cooperate. But if they could, this would be uh, an enormous uh, a trans, uh, transformation of what Alaska is. You, sir, I will call prescient. And I can tell you from working with a number of utilities in this state as recently as earlier this year, they are looking at aging, failing infrastructure, and they're turning and looking at these membrane systems, and they're looking at this, right now, the, 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 the big infrastructure grant that they're working on uh, would have like 150 or more billion dollars anyway, this national, but a big block of this likely is gonna come to Alaska. There are utilities in the state of Alaska right now looking at accessing that money to do just exactly what you're talking about and what I just described to you. Yes, that's happening. Here's, a, here's another number that I'll share with you. How big is this globally? Every year, the current addition to global desalination capacity being constructed is in excess of one billion gallons per day of new treatment is being added throughout the world, and that number is going up. Virtually any nation that is on the ocean, any ship that is floating on the ocean, any island nation that is having to take water out is now using this technology. All resorts, um, they're all looking at this technology, or they've implemented it, and the cost is dropping, the application is going up, this is the future. We did some of it here first. That's my story. And I'm sticking with it. <laughs> and you have a colleague that are working on techniques for breaking up the forever molecule, the PFOS, the firefighting foam. Is it, have they got a technique for breaking that up? 
Uh, that's an interesting question. Let me, do, let me share this with you though. Is the nanofiltration and the reverse os osmosis technology can remove it, all of it, 100%. So that is actually being done in some places which I'm not able to share the full story with you, but it is able to take it out. Now the flip side of that is a whole nother thing. Are we ever going to be able to degrade this stuff? And there is some work that is going on right now uh, by some research um, organizations and universities. I, I forget which, which colleges these are at, but they are working on a biological degradation. And I can tell you this much from having worked, I've done as much work in the wastewater business as I've done in the water business. Um, bacteria are very opportunistic. There is an energy to be gained from breaking those molecules. It's going to be very difficult, but I guarantee you there will be some very smart bacteria that figures out how to do that. And when they figure out how to do it, one becomes two, becomes four, becomes eight, 16, you, here we go. And they already have had some limited success in transforming some compounds. Unfortunately, there's still smaller PFOS compounds come out of those reactions, but they, were, they absolutely thought they were never gonna be biodegradable. They now know they are susceptible to that. Stick around, there's more. This is gonna happen. Well, that's how they're, that they have to use a uh, catalytic process and extremely high heat, high energy to do it. But yeah, some of these bacterial processes are gonna be anaerobic, some are gonna be under pressure, but they're, they're working on it. And um, I'm, I'm, very, I'm actually very optimistic. I think, we didn't think bugs would ever break down dioxins. And we found naturally occurring bacteria in, in rivers, in the Hudson River that are doing it. And that's how they came back and they said, oh my God, bacteria breaking down. And PCBs, we never thought they would break those down. And we found bacteria that would do it. If there is an energy to be gained, some bug will figure out how to tap it. You watch. Althea, Althea how are we, we doing, doing on time? time? We're, we're doing just fine. We've got some time yet. I was wondering if you would be able to tell a little bit about our villages that get in trouble with their wastewater plant treatment plants in the winter, and I hear there's a wonderful, innovative solution. Well, that's another PowerPoint. But um, what Althea is talking about is um, uh, the Rotary District of Alaska. We have 38 Rotary Clubs in Alaska, and I'm, uh, Peggy and Althea and I are actually all in the Fairbanks Rotary Club. And the organization statewide uh, is investing in what is going to be an, an innovative emergency water treatment plant. Now this is not membranes, this is a, a system that is intended and designed to be very simple. Um, it has four stages of filtration compacted into two canisters. It has a chlorination system. Um, but here's the scenario, a village loses its water system, its treatment system, or something happens mechanically, the village of Tuluksak had a fire this year, lost the whole thing. It was built in a laundromat and the laundromat burned down. And it took um, 45 days for the Yukon Cusquam Health Corporation to get a functional water treatment replacement plant in there for the village. In the meantime, they were getting pallets of water flown in um, by airplane, airplanes at great expense. Um, and people were boiling their water out of the river. But uh, almost all of these villages are located next to a clear water uh, source in the winter, even if it's a silty source like the Kuskokwim in the summer, under the water, under the ice, in the winter it runs clear. Go look at the Tanana. Take a look at what the water looks like if you drill a hole for ice fishing. It's, you can see the bottom. It's clear all the way down. So what the concept is, is that we would be able to pick up a unit with a helicopter on an aircraft constructed aluminum frame um, and completely constructed, this is about a six by six by about seven and a half foot tall unit, weighs less than 700 pounds, the first prototype, and um, it can be carried by a Hughes 500 helicopter 65 miles in one direction without refueling. Set in place a, if I lose my, my quarter must have run out. Anyway, um, the um, uh, unit would be set in place, hole drill in the water, submersible pump drops in, you fire it up and you're operating in hours not a month and a half. The first prototype of that has been built. Peggy and I are driving to Delta Junction and we're gonna watch a Hughes 500 helicopter test fly at tomorrow at 10 o'clock. We're building four of them and we're going to gift them to the regional health corporations of Alaska and we're working on raising money for more. Uh, the Denali Foundation just awarded this um, uh, sizable grant to, um, to work on the first batch of them. We've been, Rotary's been funding it so far but it's, um, 
This is remarkable. This is, this is, it's just a temporary fix to get them to the next construction season. But I think, I think we can do some serious work here. Next Monday, we're going to pilot test this unit um, out here on the Tananaw Lakes and um, demonstrate its use from a modestly clear water supply in the summer. So let's say a village is on a lake and it still hasn't recovered by the summer. Maybe we can even help them. So we're expanding the scope of this. Thank you, Althea. I appreciate that. You know, oh, one more just, question. Just a brief one, and that is the, the crucial question of what was in the water that turned black when it was mixed with the scotch and the other was pure water. How far can we go and still keep it? Manganese. 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 Uh -huh. Iron turns red, manganese turns black. Uh -huh. What comes out of my well? Bingo. Along with the uh, bodies of the old uh, dead woolly mammoths. <laughs> there you go.